that was fun. <laughs> Sorry, I suck. How is this on? Yeah, it's on. It is? Yep. Uh, my legs are bad for some reason. I think that reason is old age. Could be wrong. But Billy, thank this you for coming to see. This film ages wonderfully. Uh, it, I know when it was first released, it was uh, controversial. It wasn't as beloved as it is at this exact moment by so many people. Uh, can you talk about a little bit about the uh, early reaction to the film? How early? <laughs> <laughs> Very early. <laughs> you know, I'll be very honest with you. I've never read a review of this film. Uh, the only uh, film of mine that I've ever read a review of was The Boys in the Band. I remember that review, and I, I've kept it in the Thanks, Dad. <laughs> I, I'm not, I don't know what the reaction was because I. Uh, as you can see, I came in when the screening's over. I normally don't uh, screen my films after I finish uh, mixing them because, you know, I work on them for so long that I, I really can't uh, watch them anymore. So, I don't know, I guess some people liked it and some people hated it. And, uh, I'm sure they're both right. <laughs> And, and so how did the project come to you? It was, uh, it, was a, it was a novel. There was a novel that was loosely based on, correct? No, it, it, there was a novel called Cruising by a New York Times reporter named Gerald Walker. I don't remember reading it, but I remember, <laughs> I remember hearing about it. I hope, I hope if Mr. Walker is here tonight, <laughs> that I can get out the back door. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't remember reading the novel, but I remember a series of things that happened before I made it. There were a series of murders in the bars on the west side of New York. A long series of murders. And they were all tied to a couple of bars on the west side of New York. And I'm not sure if they were ever really solved, but they were in the papers all the time. And they were uh, in magazines and the Village Voice, and they were, there was a lot written about these murders. I'm trying to remember if they were solved, and I, I honestly don't remember. But that's my memory. Uh, I remember this series of killings, and they obviously attracted my attention and that of pretty much everyone living in New York at the time. And uh, as I started to read more and more about them, I decided to go down to the gay bars with some friends and just get a sense of what was happening. And uh, uh, I didn't see anything that would lead me to understand what in fact was happening. But I remember that the killings just kept going on and on and then eventually stopped. Um, but things like that that are uh, predominant in the news and on people's minds and in their consciousness very often interests me as subject matter for a film. And I put as many of the details of what was reported as I could in, into this film, which is a work of fiction, but very strongly based on those killings. The, the backdrop of the leather bars, I mean, you really, we really go there. I feel like I've, I've actually been there as a person from there. It, it's Maybe so weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 
Could you, you tell us if we went? I don't know. <laughs> could you? Okay. Could, <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about investigating and going in there and making it that real? I mean, it's it's an amazing place. Well, all of the people in the bars were patrons of the bars. Yep. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> Yeah, they were all people in the bars, and I started to hang out at the bars, and I got to know people and the guys who ran them, and uh, uh, when I decided to make this film, I invited the people who wanted to appear in the film to come in and, and be there as day players, and so they all were. There, there were no uh, actual... Screen Extras Guild players who were in the bars. At the time, it, it, it was extremely controversial. I don't know whether it is as controversial now as it was then, is it? Yeah. It's changed. It's like a moment of history we lost. Yes. It's a moment of history? Yeah. Absolutely. But it's, it doesn't continue, does it? I mean, uh, what? Okay. Yeah, yeah, we got the eagle, baby. The pandemic affected it big time. Yes. Yeah. The pandemic affected it big time. It affected everything. <laughs> Most things like bars like that. <laughs> Sounds like that was from an expert. <laughs> no, I really don't know. Because uh, I, I don't get out much. Uh, ever since uh, the, the pandemic, I, I haven't gone out a lot at all. And uh, then when you, you lose the lo use of your legs like that, there ain't too many places you can go. I don't go to the movies much anymore. Uh, there are very few films I, I hear about that I really want to see. Uh, but that's just me. Uh, around the time I started making films, or before I did, I really loved them and I saw almost everything, especially the classics. You know, I love the classics. <laughs> We're gonna have to set a definition of a classic. I don't mean Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. But that was a classic. <laughs> You saw Abbott and Costello read Frankenstein. Mostly the people up front, not in the back. The film didn't play in the back? That's a, that's a great film. It's up there with Citizen Kane. There's a, a character I'm obsessed with in this film. It's the sad. You need these, this thing on. Yeah. <laughs> huh? The, there's a character. Do you need this thing on? <laughs> no. Do you want it off? Do you need it? Is it in your eyes? Uh, yeah. Hey, Ivan, can we kill it? It's coming. It's coming off. I'd love to see the audience better. <laughs> see if this does the Is trick. Still awake? Yeah. <laughs> He's out there getting the taxi. Yeah, why not? <laughs> you, you, you need that thing on back there. <laughs> can, I, can we get this thing off? Yeah, that thing. Yeah. Now I, I can really see faces. Beautiful. Great. <laughs> Yay! You want, to take some, you want to take some questions from them now we see them? What? Want to take some questions from them now that we see them? Oh, sh any time. Let's do it. Any time. <laughs> right there. Greg, I, I wonder how you felt about Sorcerer in that, uh, uh, from when it was released, and, and it seems to finally got its due. I wonder what your thoughts were on that. I like Sorcerer. I, 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 lo I love the film. I can't say that about every film that I directed. 
but I love sorcerer for some reason. I think the experience of making it was so difficult and it came close to what I envisioned. Not everything you do as a filmmaker gets close to what you envisioned. There's always a lot of compromise. And you know that going in. But there, as I recall, there was less compromise with that than with anything I can recall. Now, in cruising, there's there were 40 minutes that had to be cut out. Was there was there something like that? I don't remember the exact amount. Yeah, but we went back and forth about 50 times to the ratings board. It was a game. I, I would cut out a minute and a half here, then 40 seconds more, and it just kept going on and on and on until I cut as much as I was going to, and, and it escaped. Uh, it wasn't released, it escaped. <laughs> yeah, it, right over there? This gentleman here. Oh, oh, right here. <laughs> I was wondering, was there a studio that you worked with, and what was their reaction as the filming was going on, the final product. I have, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, I, would, uh, I remember the film was distributed by uh, United Artists and, uh, and and another one of its companies. Do you remember who it says? Lorimar. Yeah, they're gone but forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> right over there. <laughs> yeah, you. Scenes, I feel like it gave it such a good, realistic atmosphere. Thank uh, you. And back to uh, feeling like I was there. Can you talk a little bit about the music in those scenes? What was the music? <laughs> <laughs> Germs! <laughs> Germs. <laughs> Germs. <laughs> Germs. <laughs> Germs. <laughs> Germs! Oh, Big Deville. Germs. Willie, Deville. Germs. Deville. Germs. Willie Deville. I love that stuff. <laughs> Willie Deville we wrote some great tracks for this picture. Who else? Rough, rough trade, the, the germs. Yeah, these were the uh, not pop bands, but the the kind of counterculture bands of the '60s, and uh, they were, uh, as I say, counterculture. They weren't, you know, it wasn't the Beatles or the Rolling Stones or the. Stoling Rones or <laughs> any of that. They, they, were, uh, they were they were a counterculture band. I was very much into that. I used to go to the clubs in New York and listen to a lot of the new music. Uh, I don't think much of it survived. Do any of you remember the music of that period? <laughs> Thanks again, Dad. <laughs> Now, you often take uh, one or two, like, very limited shots. Was this the same way with cruising? There was only a few takes? Yes, I don't like to do a lot of takes. Uh, if What I like to do is talk to the actors. I talk to them. First of all, about a week before we start shooting, we have a meeting. We go over uh, and any questions they might have or problems and I'll try to address them. And uh, uh, then as we get into it, we'll talk a little bit about what I expect from the tape, the tone, the tempi, uh, not too much else. And then we go out and do it. And if it feels realistic enough to me, it's a take. If it doesn't, I'll try to do it again until it does. Uh, but. Uh, I don't like to do a lot of takes. I, I don't think there's a, a lot to be gained in that. Uh, that's not the way I came up. When I came up, uh, the, the more well-known filmmakers were, were doing... There was a very famous director called William Wyler. William Wyler was known as 90 Take Wyler throughout the industry. And I don't know how much of an exaggeration that was, but he did a lot of takes. A lot of takes. I never saw the point in it. I would uh, 
When I started out, I was like every other amateur, and I would do take after take, hope, hoping for a miracle on about take 15. <laughs> then I'd look at the rushes, and it was usually there in the first printed take. It was as good as it was going to get. Or, or there was nothing else I could say to the actress or the actor. And so I learned that, and in the latter few films that I made, I, I never did more than one take unless uh, a camera fell into the shot or a <laughs> light fell down or uh, uh, Ronald Reagan became president. <laughs> Something like that happened. I, I had to do a new take. Well, you, you've done so many stage play adaptations to film, which Not you didn't. that many. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think I did the birthday party was from the stage. Right. The boys in the band. Woo! Killer Joe. Bug and Killer Joe. Woo! Twelve Angry Men. Twelve Angry Men. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I did that as a uh, television show. Yeah. But when you do an adaptation like that, do the, is there an expectation for actors to want to have that? And then it's a... Uh, you. I'm well, sorry, what? Is there an expectation for those kind of things that people want rehearsal? It's, it's, it's amazing that normally plays are rehearsed to death, and then you're doing one take of them and, and, and pulling and, and doing a masterful job. That's the way it goes. Yeah. You know, one take. How many takes of this do you want to do? <laughs> like when we finish this, whenever you guys say that's enough, take a hike. <laughs> you guys say, okay, next group. <laughs> Do another take of it? It exists once. <laughs> Everything of great interest to me that is not a classic is best done in one take for spontaneity. I'm not interested at all in perfection. I'm interested only in spontaneity. Like it just happened and there it is. You know, I don't want it to seem rehearsed or overwrought, and so I don't overwrite it or overwrought it. <laughs> right there. Yes, sir. First off, I'd like to say hello for a mutual friend. I was talking to Jack Hughes this afternoon. He was on my show, and he sends his love, and uh, we had a great time on my show talking about how much he loved working with you. Jack Hughes from uh, Wang, Wang Chung? Yeah. Oh, how do you know him? I know him because he was on my podcast, and uh, I want to have you on the podcast. <laughs> Aren't we on your podcast now? <laughs> oh, I love Jack Hughes. I love working with him. I love the band Wang Chung. Guys, anyone remember Wang Chung? They, they were really great, and there was something different, something else when they came along. But all really fine musicians. Great, but and also my other question is, you were once quoted in, in an interview as saying, you didn't give a flying fuck into a rolling donut what Al Pacino felt about this film. <laughs> I said what? <laughs> Don't. I mean, I can't. I can't think of anybody who I feel that way about. You know, people have their own opinions and stuff. I didn't enjoy working with Al Pacino. He was a, he was a drudge. He was a pain in the ass. He, he has given many fine performances. No question about that. But I, I didn't enjoy working with him, and therefore, I don't give a flying donut in the world. <laughs> no, he's, he's, he's a, we, we all know, everyone here knows he's a damn good actor. We all know that. I know it. You know, anyone who's, who's ever seen a children's program knows it. <laughs> he's, a damn, 
Hey, what, what, where is Al Pacino now? Ladies and gentlemen, Al Pacino! What? He's backstage. <laughs> Just kidding. Say hello. No, where, does anyone know where I haven't heard from or about Al in years? Are we in Beverly Hills? <laughs> this is a long theater. No, I haven't seen him for a long time. And I haven't seen him on films. It's strange that you, you would mention it. The Irish man. The Irish man. That's the good shit, though. Not necessarily at all. I do read film reviews. I've tried to read a few reviews of my films, and I haven't found anything I could relate to in them, so I just gave up trying. <laughs> you know, it's not easy to comprehend someone else's opinion about something that you've done. Uh, unless you're, you know, really... Uh, into reading about yourself, which I'm not. I, I don't read about myself. There's a few books about me that I haven't read, but I recommend them. <laughs> yeah, that's general Speaking of what you said about spontaneity, I think you have one of the greatest, most spontaneous moments in the interrogation scene. You talk about the, the black man in the jockstrap. <laughs> the black man in the jockstrap. That's, that's what used to happen. They used to, when they were interrogating the suspect in those days, this was, what was this film? The 70s? 1980. 80? Yeah. When the hell was that? <laughs> Did I miss 1975? Uh, that actually happened. I saw that. I used to, uh, I, have, I still have a lot of friends in the New York Police Department, and I used to go to interrogations, and they let me go to crime scenes and stuff, and I saw that happen. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I was in the room at the time, and I had to put my hand over my mouth to stop from laughing. Imagine you're a suspect in something which you may or may not have done, and a six foot seven black guy comes in the room and uh, slaps you in the face and walks out. He's wearing nothing but a jock strap. So when, if you want to report it to the police, you say, you know what happened? A six foot seven black guy came in the room with a jock strap only and slapped me in the face. Okay. <laughs> we used to do that, stuff like that. You know, that no one would believe in a sitting behind a court bench. Yes. Um, one, one thing that I love about your films is that it seems like every five or ten years there's some sort of major reassessment of what they mean, the significance of the ideas. And I'm curious whether you look back at some of your favorite films, whether your own work or others, and kind of something you like that now you don't, or something that you loved many years ago that now you feel. I appreciate the question. I don't know if you heard it. We did. You want me to repeat it? Yes. I, do I look back at the films I made and, uh, and how they were reviewed or received uh, from many years ago? No, I, you never look back. Never look back. You gotta try to keep going if you can. And that means tapping into your imagination. Not your memory, your imagination. I imagine memory is very important. I, I imagine so because I lost mine. And uh, 
I mean, it's not as good as it was. Uh, uh, but uh, the point I'm trying to make is I don't look back. I'm trying to remember the, the first film I made, and I can't. I'm trying to remember the last film I made, and look. What was it? Does anyone remember? The Devil and Father Amort. Yeah. The Devil and Father Amort. It was a, a documentary about the Vatican exorcist, which I made a, a number of years ago. And it was a, an exorcism that he was performing that he allowed me to sit in on and film. Uh, why he did it, I, I, I don't know. We became friends. He liked the film I made of The Exorcist, and so he let me photograph uh, an actual one that he had performed. I haven't seen it since it came out. Well, unfortunately, you have your memoirs. There's a lot of stuff that could have been lost to memory or history that is somewhere. Is that my memoir? A <laughs> <laughs> memoir by... Did Peter Bogdanovich write that? <laughs> Peter, God bless you wherever you are. And good night, Mrs. Calabash, wherever you are. Did anyone know that phrase? Mm -hmm. You remember that? Mm -hmm. Nobody remembers Jimmy Durante. Yeah. Yeah. He used to close all of his radio and television shows by saying, Good night, Mrs. Calabash, wherever you are. And I don't think anyone, I never read who Mrs. Calabash was. <laughs> but I'm going to say good night to her when we leave. Aww. Wherever you are, Mrs. Calabash. Your first film, that was People vs. Paul Crumb, is that the, fir the first film? So it is? The I'm not sure that that was the first thing I filmed, The People vs. Paul Crump, who was a, a black man on death row. And when I met him, he was going to the electric chair in, I think, about six months. And I heard about him. It's funny how things happen and how you have to be open to all experiences. I, I really don't like parties. I don't like to go to parties. And, uh, but I went to this one party in Chicago. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, yes. Oh. And uh, I went to this one party, and it was a massive group of people, and I was standing next to a priest. And uh, we each had a drink in our hand and uh, hands, and he, I said, oh, uh, Father, I introduced myself, and I said, where is your uh, parish? And he said, oh, oh I, I don't have a parish. I'm the uh, Protestant chaplain at the Cook County Jail on death row. Yeah. And that caught my attention. <laughs> the first thing I blurted out when I heard that was, have you ever met anyone on death row that you thought was innocent? And he said, as a matter of fact, there's a, a guy now. He's an African-American. He's 32 years old. And his name is Paul Crump, C-R-U-M-P. And I think he's innocent uh, of killing a guard at a robbery and the warden of the Cook County Jail at the time. And that man named Jack Johnson thinks that he's innocent. This was on a Friday night, and I, I thought about little else throughout the weekend. On Monday, I called the county jail, and I called this uh, priest, and I asked him if he could uh, get me a meeting with the warden, and he did. And I went to see the warden, and I became friendly with him, and I said, is it possible that I could meet Paul Crump? He's going to the electric chair in six months. The warden said, well, why do you want to meet him? I said, I, I really don't know. I said, but I, I work in television, which I did at the time in Chicago, and maybe there's something I can do with his story. 
He says, nothing can be done with his story. He's going on a lecture chair. In six months. So I, I don't know, I persisted. And finally I got a meeting with Paul Crump. I heard his story. I researched it. And it was very complex. But I decided to try to do an investigative film about that murder and his participation in it. And I made this film, which saved his life. He was pardoned from death row, and about nine years later, they let him out of prison. And he lived another maybe 10 or 15 years a free man. And grace of God. That's what I feel, that's how I see it. And uh, I don't know to this day whether he was guilty or innocent. I know at the time I did not think he was guilty. Because in those days, if you were an African American and you were picked up by the Chicago Police Department for a capital crime, you were dead meat. You were, you were gone. And he fell into that category. All the way in the back here, if your hand up. Sir, I was curious, uh, out of all the actors, and you've worked with quite a few, uh, I'm wondering, was Gene Hackman the best movie you've ever worked with? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was going to No, seriously. So, the gentleman asked if Gene Hackman was the best actor I've worked with, and the laughter broke up. <laughs> Is it yeah. Chevy Chase? <laughs> Chevy Chase. Why, why, why do people laugh at Gene Hackman? It's a loaded question. It's like, it's an obvious, you know, they're going to say, I answer any question. Yeah, but he's leading. <laughs> what, what is the answer? Yeah. He's one of the best. Is, is he the best I've ever worked with? Yes, sir. Let me think a second. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think those things through, so let me see. He was not a pleasure to work with. <laughs> I'll tell you when I realized that he was really a good actor. When he won the Academy Award. <laughs> time, it was just another experience with, 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 he wasn't the most motivated actor I've ever heard. Uh, who would be the best? Uh, William Peterson? Oh, certainly way up there. Yeah, I love working with Bill Peterson. Absolute pleasure, which I did a couple of times. And we're talking about doing something else now. Max von Sydow is an incredible. Max von Sydow is, was great. One of the great actors in the world was Max von Sydow uh, from The Exorcist. Uh, and so many other great films made mostly in Sweden. And of course he made uh, the greatest story ever told in this country. He was great. Peterson, great. Uh, I loved working with Ellen Burstyn. Woo! Ellen Burstyn. Woo! And uh, those come immediately to mind. Here's a lesser note. I'm just curious about Joe Spinell. Yes. What was it like working with Joe? Who in the fuck is Joe Spinell? <laughs> He's okay. <laughs> Was he one of the best actors I've ever worked with? <laughs> you have your answer. <laughs> no. Why did you 
say Joe Smith? Because <laughs> I love Joe Smith. He's great in this. He's just fascinating to watch do anything. That's why I always just... Yeah, he, he's, he was very interesting. Very, I, I don't think he ever got his due, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. He was damn good. Some people get their due and more than their due, and some people don't. Uh, a number of actors I worked with I think are overrated, and some are underrated. Uh, it's what happens, you know? I'm overrated. <laughs> yes. We got right there. Uh, you all agree? <laughs> I know you said you don't remember reading the book, but I'm a geek and I did read the book. And the, the killer in the book is actually very specific. And um, the killer in the movie is like pretty vague. Like we don't know who the killer is. And I Wait, love which book are you talking about? Cruising, Cruising the book. <laughs> Cruising the night. What's that? I never read it. Well, okay, but either, either way, what, can you talk about why the killer is like so vague in the movie? Like, we don't really know who it is. Why should you? <laughs> Did you know who did these five murders in Stockton? Is anyone? Uh, it's six now, I believe. Is it now six? It's now six. That's terrifying. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if any of you have ever been to Stockton. It's a, it's a small town. Six murders, Jesus, uh, and they don't know who the killer is. There's so many unsolved murders. The police are very heroic on television, and many are heroic in real life, but they don't solve every crime put in front of them, you know, like they did on Dragnet. Do you ever, <laughs> remember Dragnet? <laughs> Just the facts, ma'am, only the facts. <laughs> that guy was great. <laughs> Jack Webb, remember Jack Webb? There's nobody like that. But, no, they, they, often they, these things are, are not discovered or discovered late. There's so many uh, cases that interest me that are unsolved and that it's actually terrifying. There are people, some of them might be in this audience. <laughs> One of them might be on this stage. Who <laughs> is actually terrifying. <laughs> No, uh, the, the, the murders in uh, Stockton are, are very troubling because that is, you, you know, Stockton's a very small town. Yeah, I was here. Yes? We had a different approach, Pacino and I. Pacino loved to do take after take, hoping for a miracle on about take 30. <laughs> and I, I don't believe is not strong enough a word. I, believe, I worship spontaneity. I don't like anything that seems rehearsed. Uh, or uh, is rehearsed, or I believe it. I try to cast actors who can learn a role and make it their own, and do it in their own words, unless the words are by someone like Harold Pinter, you know, which I've done, I've done a Pinter play on film. Uh, and he was great to work with. And you couldn't improvise Pinter's work, you know, it was expertly written and to the point. There aren't many other writers I've worked with who who had that. Right there, sir. So did you design any of the of the posters for your movies? Were any of the posters done? I designed the poster for The Exorcist. Woo! Yeah.
it's, uh, it's a still from the frame, from the film. <laughs> when uh, Father Marin is about to enter the house and a light shines down from the little girl's window. I, that shot's in the film and I decided to use it as the poster. Uh, I originally wanted a picture myself, <laughs> but I was overruled. <laughs> right there, sir. Uh, do you remember the, the process of how you came up with the ending for the the, 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 how I came up with the ending for cruising. It occurred to me along the way that the cruising murders, uh, there were actual killings, were unsolved. And I decided to leave the film unsolved. You know, I have no idea who the, if there was one person or who it was. It was the killer in Cruzy. I honestly have no idea. I, I don't even have a theory. And I often approach things that way. I like to discover them as I make them. And usually they tell me something about themselves as I... It's like when you meet a person that you like who becomes a friend. You don't know them originally, let's say, unless by reputation or something. Uh, but you don't know this person, then you get to know them and you continue to be friends or whatever, or you don't. But that, that's how I approach, you know, most of the, the, the films I make. I'm not certain of what the ending is or should be. I know what it, often what they could be, but I don't think it's my work, I don't speak about other filmmakers, I don't think it's my work to tell the audience what to think. Mm -hmm. I want the audience to think for themselves. And if, if my work doesn't provoke an audience to think for themselves, so it's a failure to me. Right there in the middle. Uh, on the subject of spontaneity, how much room uh, would you give actors uh, to maybe add their own uh, improvisations, how closely to the script that you do want to stay? And then as well as uh, for anything that was very, any shots that were very planned, how did you pull spontaneity out of those moments? Uh, in, in the early days, the performances in my films were not spontaneous. 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 What is it? Spontaneous. That's what I said. Uh, this guy's trying to rip me off. Uh, um, how much spontaneity? In the early days, none. And then I realized that that was boring. <laughs> that I'm interested in presenting a story to the audience about which they should arrive at their own conclusions and their own thoughts. And if it's negative, so be it. That's my fault, usually. Um, because the kind of films I made usually attract uh, audiences that, that like to go to cinema. And I want them to, to think for themselves, because that's what cinema can do. Uh, the other night I saw a film that I haven't seen for maybe 50 years, and it played fresh for me. It was. Uh, Simone Signore and H.G. Uh, Clouseau's Diabolique. Oh. Have you ever seen Diabolique? <laughs> right up into the, into the last frame, Diabolique is spontaneous. And then I guess someone made him attach an Andy. But up until that last moment, that, that film really holds you because 
especially the first time you see it, you have no idea where it's going or what's coming. And that's, that's cinema to me. I'm not talking about a comedy, you know, certainly not. But drama, yes. I like for the audience to discover it for themselves. That's what I like to do. If I go to see a film, I want to discover it. And I don't need to have all the answers laid out for me. In fact, I prefer it if they're not. If you're working with an actor and you feel like they're not being spontaneous or it's too premeditative, do you do anything? Do you have any tactics to bring it out? I'll break it down, start over again, and change the words. <laughs> Rewrite all the words, sometimes with the writer there. Now, the one film I didn't do that with and wouldn't think of it is uh, Harold Pinter. Yeah. <laughs> right in the birthday party which Harold Pinter are you, are you familiar with Harold Pinter? Yes. How many are familiar with that? Oh yes. Great. Well that's not that many. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't 75% uh, of the audience. Much less. Uh, Harold Pinter is a great writer to me and his work always seemed spontaneous though it was carefully written. The film I made is not the best Pinter film I've ever seen. That might be something like The Servant. Yeah. Uh, or Accident. You see Accident? Yeah. Both Losey, right? Joseph Losey was the director. Yeah. And Losey and Pinter made some wonderful films. And Pinter died way before his time. Uh, but I, I loved very much, and I learned so much working with Pinter. That's probably the period in which I learned the most about filmmaking and drama, was working with Harold Pinter. Okay, a couple more right there. Uh, just to go back to that the iconic shot of the actress to send you to the poster. When you were on set, I that up. I saw it with, with my eye. The question was, did I look through the lens and line up, you know, the shot that became the ad for The Exorcist that's in the film? Uh, you asked me if... Uh, so, how do you, how you set that up? Like, did, it, did that trail up the way you originally had it? What thing? The, how did it turn out, uh, come about? When you're directing a film, you're almost completely involved with it to little else. If, you, if you're a family man, you're not that good a family man when you're directing a film. <laughs> the film becomes your family. And you think of it night and day. And when you wake up and just before you go to sleep, you think about it and things will come to you. Everything I've ever done has, has come to me. It, it has not been uh, premeditated, including that shot you're talking about from The Exorcist, which is the title frame. Uh, it seemed to me when I found the house that I wanted and I saw the way it was constructed and that I could do that, I could have a light shining from that upstairs corner window shining down on the arrival of the priest that seemed to me like a discovery and I remember now that it did so because just before that I had been to the uh, Museum of Modern Art in New York and I saw a painting by Rene Magritte Empire of, Empire of Light. That's the painting. And I, I guess I've thought a great deal since as well about the Empire of Light, that particular painting. Uh, and I used that as a model for the, the title shot of The Exorcist. 
Daytime on the top. That's daytime on top and nighttime on the bottom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, the shot I made wasn't that. No, no, the Empire, <laughs> the Empire of Light, which is, uh, you know, a great surrealist work by the Greek. But that's what influenced me to do that shot that way. I often see things in paintings that I like, and they influence me to do something maybe a little bit different, or I just rip it off. Things are done perfect. What? Things are done no perfect. The atmosphere just sat perfectly in the right way. Thank you. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. Um, Aside from the music that's actually used in the club, I love the score that you've got for each in the film. And you've worked with him before, uh, obviously, but you also have used people like Wayne Chung and Tianjin Dream and the skewed more orchestral scores. One of the first filmmakers I could think of regularly. Is there a reason why, and how do you figure out how to work with someone like Nietzsche versus Tianjin Dream or Oldfield? Like, where does that come from? Inspiration. Uh, I don't think I knew any of them before I worked with them. I sought them out after listening to their music. I haven't heard anything today that makes me want to do that. I haven't for years, but I did at that time. And, uh, yeah, Jack Nietzsche passed away, wrote some wonderful scores and popular music as well. You, you quest for spontaneity. How does that work in making the two greatest car chase scenes of all time? Uh, how, how do you do that and retain spontaneity? Well, I, I didn't do uh, Bugs Bunny Goes to Church. <laughs> which is the best car chase. <laughs> I vote, you know, I, I don't know how, how many car chases have I done. Two or three. Uh, I love the form. That that's what it comes. It's pure cinema. A car chase is pure cinema. You don't need any words. It's images, and images that are exciting. Uh, how did I get started with car chases? I, the first one was, I guess... Uh, French Connection, right? Was that the first? I'm trying to think. Yeah, I guess it probably was the first, the French Connection. And in the actual French Connection chase, in the actual uh, story, of the French Connection, which was a true story. that had happened 10 years before. They always say that, it's a true story. Everything is a true story. Uh, uh, have I offended you, sir? <laughs> I didn't need him anymore. Uh, look, this gentleman came back. French Connection Chase was purely inspiration. Uh, I felt instinctively that the film needed some kind of a heavy action sequence, which I didn't have in the actual story. And uh, I just dreamt it up. Uh, it occurred to me that there had been a number of interesting chase scenes in the past, in the distant past, by people like D.W. Griffith and Magic Johnson. No, uh, <laughs> no, uh, and I started to think about how to do a chase that could be intrinsic to the plot. Mm could come out of the plot, but not be a car chasing a car. So what was it gonna be? And I started thinking about it and talk about it with my producer. 
and we would, we would meet every day for a while, and we would spitball a chase scene, and that's what we did. We just made it up as we walked. I remember we walked for 55 blocks straight in New York. You walk down certain streets in New York, and if you're a filmmaker, you start to think about how you would use them, and that's what happened to me. Uh, I had no ulterior purpose or motives. What is the job of a director to you? Like, what, what is it at that job that you to are To be the do? first one in line for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> That's about it. Uh, there's, there's too much jive attached to film. Film directors become legends. Some of them are entitled to it. <laughs> Orson Welles. Thank you, Mrs. Welles. Uh, Orson Welles is a justifiable legend to me. Uh, who else? Stanley Kubrick. My God. He is a justified legend. Uh, I, I, not many others come to mind. Uh, David Lean? David Lean, great filmmaker. Tony Scott. Who? Who? Tony Scott. Tony Scott? <laughs> he rest in peace. Tony Scott, may he rest in peace, has passed away. He was a very fine filmmaker. But to me, the the great action filmmakers were Kubrick, and, uh, because they, they had all of Kubrick's work had an underlying sensibility, an underlying uh, outlook on the world. Uh, there were much more than the sum of their parts. Uh, Kubrick, to me, is a great filmmaker. Wells was in a couple of films. Um, who else? Uh, the Silence? Keaton? Chaplin? Who? Keaton or Chaplin? Are you the Silence? Oh, I'm not talking about the silent filmmakers. That, that's a different... Hitchcock? Hitchcock. Woo! Yeah, I worked with Hitchcock. Uh, I did the very last... I directed the last Alfred Hitchcock hour. Mm. Nice. It was called uh, Off Season with John Gavin still plays, and I, I met Hitchcock, who was a strange bird. <laughs> uh, this was my one major encounter with Alfred Hitchcock. He came on the set uh, on the next to last day that I was directing uh, a, a Hitchcock hour with John Gavin called Off Season. And Mr. Hitchcock came on the set, and I was introduced to him by the producer of the Hitchcock hour, a man named Norman Lloyd. And, and uh, I, I shook his hand. He, he held out his hand, which was like holding a wet fish. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, Mr. Hitchcock, what a great honor it is for me to meet you. And he looked at me and he said, Mr. Friedkin, usually our directors wear ties. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I was late and getting dressed this evening, and he was gone. <laughs> I, that's my only encounter with this one. Psycho. If there's a scarier film than Psycho, I don't know what it is. Yes, it is. The Exorcist cannot hold Psycho's jockstrap. <laughs> 
the time for maybe a couple of no, months. I'm not joking. The cycle is so tight, so right to the point, right on the money. And then the last shot of this guy sitting in a prison cell, and, and you hear his voice, Anthony Perkins, and he's got this strange look on his face. And you hear his inner voice, it's chilling. To this day, yeah. I still watch Psycho. I must have seen it, well, countless times, yeah. countless. 70, 80 times, because you can count to that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can count to that. I knew this gentleman could count to that. Uh, no, Psycho, wow. And I'm trying to think, what other films move me in that genre? And I'm hard put to come to any. Diabolique is another by H.G. Clouseau. Yes. Onibaba. Onibaba. Yes, a Japanese film, another one. That Texas I love. Chainsaw. What? Texas Chainsaw. That's in a different category, Texas Chainsaw. That's more exploitational. Yeah. It's good. Damn, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I knew Toby Hooper, I'm proud to say, very well. And I love this film. Shall we take one more? Take as many as you want. <laughs> right, right there. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask, you said you love classics, and I think for a lot of us, your films are considered to be classics, so I'm wondering... Uh, what, dude? Um, I was going to say, you said you love the classics, and for many of us, I think your films are considered to be like the classic canonical film, so I'm wondering what it's like to see your film sort of be accepted by the culture and so important. I don't think in those terms, honestly. Every film I made was a, was a job. Directing films is a damn good job. <laughs> Try it sometime. <laughs> It was a, it's a damn good job, and that's what it always was to me. And I don't mean by using that word to diminish it. It's a, it's a damn good job directing films. And rarely do they come out as I intended. But when one does, uh, I feel very pleased about that. Often the ones that didn't come out that well are the ones that unfortunately stay with me. Uh, but I, no, I haven't made any classics. Let's be serious. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, no. Classics. Citizen Kane. All About Eve. The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. What? What film is that? John, John Houston, The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. Fantastic, classic. I continue to watch that. Uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure. <laughs> I haven't seen a new film that I consider classic for a long time. I'm looking forward to the new film by Damien Chazelle, whose work I really like. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Daddy. <laughs> oh, hi, Mom. <laughs> the Cruising was shot in New York at the same time as another gay, iconic film. You can't stop the music. What? <laughs> you said cruising in the same sentence with you can't stop the music? Got me. <laughs> All right, what about you can't stop the music? Well, uh, okay, never mind that then. <laughs> so, uh, I always wondered because your scenes in cruising are so short, like, they're just a few sentences when people are in rooms and out of rooms. Is that like, in, is that because there were protesters outside streaming music to interrupt the filming? Or is that from the script level? That's how you imagine it. Fuck the protesters. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I haven't thought about the protesters from then until you mentioned them. <laughs> yes. I don't care about protesters. Look, in many ways, to me, that's a good thing. If people are legitimately protesting because they're angry or pissed off or in some way moved, positively or negatively, that's okay with me. Because what you're trying to do as a filmmaker is reach people emotionally. That's it. Whether you make them laugh, cry, or be scared. I want to reach people, if I can, emotionally, and that ain't easy. Yes. What else? <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> Uh, the scenes being short, like the scenes are very uh, short, crisp, clean cuts. I didn't notice that. I don't notice that the scenes are any shorter in cruising than anything else I made. Well, I, 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 I honestly, God, have never noticed that. I'll have to take a look at them. And maybe put some stuff back. <laughs> yeah. Who wants to see cruising the final cut? <laughs> That footage, does that footage exist, any of the stuff? There's about 40 minutes that I took out of cruising. Oh, bring it back! Uh, Where is it? It's hard to do, you know? It's, it's hard to bring back because you have an entirely new audience today. I imagine very few of you are alive. Who was alive when I made cruising? Or an adult? Who was an adult? Oh. <laughs> One guy! Was there anyone else who was an adult when I made cruising? Yeah. What? Yeah. Hey. Hey. Okay. <laughs> you want to see it again? Yeah. Love an extended cut. I tell you, I, I don't know if I would love an extended cut, but if you guys ever want to run cruising, I'll come and show it to you. Yeah. <laughs> I'll show you my personal print. Yeah. Which, which does consist of other stuff. Yeah. I think it is about 40 minutes. I cut around 40 minutes out uh, because of the studio at the time, United Artists, which I don't think exists anymore. But cruising still exists. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. <laughs> she asked me if there are any other films I would recommend. I shortened up the question. Are there any films that I would recommend aside from the ones I mentioned? Do I mention Citizen Kane? You, everybody has to see that. That's the Bible. It's the Bible of cinema. If you believe anything I've said tonight, believe that. Uh, uh, Citizen Kane, All About Eve, Treasure of Sierra Madre. Uh, I would say, uh, now I have to reach, but Paths of Glory. Stanley Kubrick. 2001. Yes. Stanley Kubrick. Dr. Strangelove. <laughs> Stanley Kubrick. Uh, the Killing. Fantastic film. The Killing. Uh, what else? Uh, I'm trying to think. There are some others. Uh, let me. What? Kazan? Ilya Kazan, is on the waterfront. Oh, Ilya Kazan, who was a great friend of mine and a director who I admired greatly. On the waterfront is a masterpiece. Uh, what? Streetcar? 
I, I don't relate that much to Streetcar Named Desire, although I know it's some kind of a great film. But it's in, certainly as much Tennessee Williams as Elia Kazan. America, America is maybe one of just... America, America. I don't Love remember that, that as, as much. I'm trying to think. Baby what, Jane. Whatever happened to Baby Jane? Whatever happened to Baby Jane? That sucks. <laughs> about a film that doesn't suck. <laughs> Made before 1960. Uh, what? Stagecoach. Stagecoach. <laughs> double indemnity. That's, oh, double indemnity. That's pretty damn good. I love double indemnity. Love it. Uh, Metropolis, very good. Sunset Boulevard! Oh, yeah. Billy Wilder! Billy Wilder, great, great filmmaker. Uh, it's a Wonderful Life. Says who? <laughs> if you're living in the Ukraine right now, you ain't watching It's a Wonderful Life. <laughs> I'm trying to think. I, uh, I know we all have favorites. Yojimbo. Yojimbo is damn good. Akira Kurosawa. I met Kurosawa. I gave a party in New York for Kurosawa when he came for his only visit. And he, he was a wonderful man. He had attempted suicide. Can you imagine this great master? He, was, he became so out of favor in Japan that he had almost committed suicide. His life was saved. I worship the ground he rests in. Kurosawa. Uh, who, who in the hell else? Uh, who? I, I appreciate Bergman. I, I, it's, to me, watching Bergman is like eating food that's good for you. <laughs> That's just personal. Yeah. What? Jean Renoir. Who? Jean Renoir. I know nothing about his films. I watched them. I can't tell you anything I can recall. Uh, Bertolucci. That was a good film. Darn. Bertolucci. Uh, well, the great Bertolucci film. Darn. That wasn't his film. <laughs> Last Tango in Paris, I love that. I think that's great. That's a wonderful freeform film. It's so unexpected to this day. How many of you like, or how many have seen Last Tango in Paris? Do you like it? Anybody don't like it? Get the hell out of here. What else? Ben Ford. Who? Oh, John Ford? Jaws. Ben Jaws? Deer Hunter. Uh, I, I don't like Jaws that much. I know it's very well made. But you know, it's I don't care what's well made. I care what appeals to me personally for some personal reason. Don't you? Yes. We don't know what the great films are. We know what appeals to us. We want to see a film that's going to appeal to us. And if it's a great film, fine. I, I know films that are not considered great that I, I like to watch. Yes. Uh, but uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> I didn't hear. <laughs> the room? <laughs> What the hell is the movie? <laughs> uh, what is that? Notoriously bad film. <laughs> I don't know the movie. Ed Wood! Ed Wood is 
is as bad as it gets. It's so bad that it's terrible. All the Ed Wood fans are leaving. John Cassavetes. I knew him and I liked him very much. There's a couple of films. What would I do? Shadows. Shadows. <laughs> Killing of a Chinese bookie. That's a terrific movie. Opening night. What? Woman Under the Influence. Woman Under the Influence. Great. Jenna Rollins. What? Faces. Yeah. I know that less well. The Dirty Dozen. The Dirty Dozen? I like the love of the Couple more. Right in the back in the middle. Yeah. Um, between the boys and the band, which happened in a very self-contained environment, and this film, which happened, you know, across an entire city, how does the storytelling change as a director between those two very different settings? God, is that a great question? Yeah. Between a film like the boys and the band that's shot in one room, and uh, what? What was the other one? Cruising. 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 Which takes place over the city. What? Versus cruising that takes place over a whole city. And cruising. What about them? <laughs> <laughs> how does, as a director, how does storytelling change in those two very different the types of settings? Storytelling city? never changes. To a filmmaker, it's a very personal thing, the most personal thing. What story do you like? What story are you attracted to? And they don't have to be of a kind. They can be different, like the boys in the band and the birthday party, or whatever you, you said. They're, they're different. They attracted me for different reasons. The boys in the band attracted me because it's such a great script with wonderful characters, uh, many of whom I knew while I lived in New York. And I knew the writer, and uh, I think it's, it was a tremendous script, and that's what attracted me. Uh, the birthday party, Harold Pinter, I, I screwed that up. I did not make a good film out of the birthday party. It, it, the film is not as good as the play deserved. Not as good. Sorry. I am sorry. Not only for those of you who saw it, but for myself. It was just, it didn't make it for me. Um, what did make it for me? Uh, oh, I imagine many of you saw my uh, masterpiece, Birth of a Nation. <laughs> None of you have seen that. Okay, next. <laughs> Right there. What's the project that got away? What's the project that you really hoped you were going to be able to make, but either time or money or studio interference stopped it from being made? God, it's a great question. I don't know. You have stumped me. The duck will come down and have you a hundred dollars. What's the one that got me? What is a film I wanted to make that got away? I don't, I can't think of one. There must be several, but I, I don't know. I, I would tell you, I don't know. Exorcist 3? What? Exorcist 3? What? <laughs> Exorcist 3. You were supposed to direct Exorcist 3. No way would I ever direct Exorcist 3. <laughs> I wouldn't... <laughs> Next case. <laughs> right there. Hi, uh, i got to ask. Have you seen Exorcist 2? Have I seen Exorcist 2? I did see it. I don't remember a frame of it. I remember thinking at the time it was a total piece of shit. <laughs> I don't know why.
why I saw it. <laughs> I remember that the head of this Warner Brothers studio said to me when they finished it, he said, congratulations, you're a grandfather. <laughs> Meaning, we're putting out Exorcist 2. So I watched it and came, came close to suicide. <laughs> I think if I ever wanted to commit suicide, I would watch Exorcist 2. And if that failed, I would watch Exorcist 3. No, that stuff... Oh, man. Jeez, I, I hate the memory of those things. Right over there, in the corner. Yeah. Uh, you spoke a lot about your inspiration and what inspired your great films. Uh, I was just wondering if you tapped into any kind of anger when you created music, because I drew a lot of similarities between this and Scorpio Rising. I was wondering if you were on your radar. I'm sorry. Uh, did you watch any Kenneth Anger, Scorpio Rising when making I saw Scorpio Rising. I don't think it had anything to do with cruising. I thought it was, for what it was, terrific. In its time, I haven't seen it for maybe 50 years. I don't know. playing your head at all? No, no, no. Do you, do you remember it? Absolutely. Is it good? Beautiful. Okay. <laughs> all right. I honestly don't I remember the title and little... Who made that? Who directed it? Kenneth Anger. Kenneth Anger, okay. Yeah, I don't remember it. I'm sorry. I, I remember the title. I will do a final question. Who has the best question? No, that's all right. There's a couple. A couple more. We'll do these right there. Wait. That's all about the best question, but it is about cruising. Um, you, you talked earlier about how the murders themselves, and of course the film, the case itself, remains somewhat open-ended. But there's another aspect of the story that is open-ended, and that is the character's relationship with himself. And I'm curious, at what point did that become a major part of the story? His questioning his own sexuality, to some extent. He won. His question was, in what part of the making of the film did uh, the character, the Pacino character's uh, character sort of arrive at who he was and what he was? It came along about halfway. It occurred to me because I think a lot about the films I've directed, although many of you may not believe so, uh, but I think a lot about them while I'm making them, and I get ideas that aren't in the original script. I remember thinking a lot about cruising while I was making it, and about halfway into it, it occurred to me that I didn't know who the killer was, but I thought it could be the Pacino character. It could be. I'm not saying it was, but if you look at the last shot of the film, it could definitely be. It could be. I honestly don't know. I mean, it's not based on some literal actual case. There were a series of murders in that world at that time. Who did the voice work of the killer? Who did the voice work of the killer? I forget his name. He was a, a New York actor that I've worked with. I'm sorry, I forget his name. He's fantastic. He was good, yeah. <laughs> he, he was in one of my films. And uh, it occurred to me, long after I started the film, that he was killing his own father. And so the voice that he hears in his head is his father's voice. Anything else? The, the killers, it's like a chain, right? So the person who killed the first person is then killed in the second. It's, it, it, it's all it, it, very the ambiguous. Talking <laughs> the killer, when you watch them killed, you're watching the, the murderer then become a victim, right? Throughout. I don't remember that. Is that what happens? <laughs> yeah, the, the actor that was the killer, the, the first kill, plays the second victim. Yeah, I just didn't want to pay two actors. Pay <laughs> 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 uh, I don't know why I did that. <laughs> I don't know why, but that was.
was one of the reasons, certainly. <laughs> Way in the back. Yes, yes ma'am, the white. Hey. Oh. Over there, straight ahead. Me? <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh. The Brinks job. The Brinks job? Yeah. What about it? Do you have anything to say about it? Nothing to say about it. <laughs> what? It's an unsuccessful film. What about Warren Oates? Warren Oates was a great actor. I loved working with Warren Oates. Do any of you know who Warren Oates was? Yeah. Great. Warren Oates was a great actor. A former Marine. Huh? <laughs> Roy Scheider? No, Warren Oates. Are you in our Marine Corps? I was in the Marine Corps. Were you in the Corps to get? No, he's older than you. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Someone else who hasn't. Yeah, who hasn't raised a uh, question? Over there. Um, so, throughout the years, they say the exorcist is haunted. Do you feel, did you feel anything personally spooky happen on set, or it's just Hollywood hearsay? Well, the first day we had a new caterer, it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, nothing spooky happened on the set. <laughs> Let me give you a piece of advice. Many of you may have made films, or would like to, or whatever. Get a good caterer. <laughs> I get the best caterer you can. <laughs> right there in the middle. Yeah. That's you. Uh, in cruising, was any footage ever done of Al Pacino actually partaking in the homosexual acts with any of the men? Because I read that some were cut in the 40 minutes that there were like sex scenes of Pacino with other men. Was that never shot? No. I, I've never heard that. <laughs> no. I don't know what man would want to have sex with the chief. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Wait a second. Let me think. Is there a woman? What they did offset is their own business. <laughs> right over there. Where? Right. Right. Where, uh, well, we talked about some pretty iconic films tonight. French Connection, The Exorcist, Live and Die in LA. I just kind of wanted to stand and speak for my personal favorite, the stylish underdog, Jade. Why is, it, why is it suddenly lonely in here? <laughs> I love Jay, man, I don't care about it. How do you feel about being lonely in a crowd? <laughs> Jay has some good points and a lot of bad points, I think. Uh, I, I loved working with Linda Fiorentino and, and David Cruiser. I, I liked working with him. And Chas Palm and Cherry. They were terrific to work with. That's what I recall from that's usually what I remember about some of these pictures. Is there anything else that will hold the attention of the handful of people left in this? <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. 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 I, so, I heard you talk before about 2001 A Space Odyssey, and you didn't include it in a list of most important films because you felt like films after 2001 did not evolve the way that uh, cinema should have. I was wondering if there were any other films that you have seen that you thought, wow, this is like the next step of cinema, but then like, no one or not as many followed suits. I really Sorry, don't understand. What? Sorry, what I mean is that you had said before that 2001, despite being an amazing film, uh, did not change cinema like as much. Oh, I don't know if it changed cinema. It probably did. But I, I don't know. I, if I said something as stupid as it, it did or didn't change cinema, shame on me. <laughs> because that's not for me to decide. What are the films that changed me? Those are the only ones I can really speak about. And some of them may, may be obscure. Uh, 
But I named the ones that came immediately to mind. When, yes. What I, what I meant for were, were there films that you loved so much that you felt like were very important, revolutionary, but uh, others did not think so? I don't know that. I don't know what anyone thinks. I don't know what anyone in this audience thinks of as their favorite film. And it's none of my business. It's, that's something I think is very personal to people, and they don't need to answer for it, or defend it, or deny it, or whatever. Uh, changed cinema? What changed cinema? God, I don't know. I'd like to say Citizen Kane, except changed it to what? <laughs> Who made a film like that? Who made a film in that vein? Who made a film that's as memorable? Citizen Kane was 1941, and we still watch it. 1941 is at least five years ago. <laughs> I, I don't know what changed cinema, except, you know, the very early works. Uh, I think it's just like the, the techniques that are developed for it, uh, how it affects other filmmakers. Or like they, they Technique is not important to me. Story is important. How well the filmmakers tell the story, whoever they may be. They may be people I don't know or had never heard of before. Like I was very impressed by uh, that first film by Damien Chazelle. I think that's a, a wonderful picture. He hasn't made one since, has he? He's made La La Land. A, what? La La Land. First Man and First Man. What's first? Oh, that was an astronaut movie. Yeah, I don't remember that so well. Uh, I don't remember that well. Someone all the way in the back has been. Uh, I think Sorcerer is one of the most extremely tense filmmaking experiences of any film. Can you talk a little bit about constructing tension in your scenes? Thank you. I guess you all heard that. Yes. Yeah. Anyone didn't? Anyone would not want to? <laughs> uh, Suspense is made up of so many parts. The main part is the audience's investment in the character or characters and the situations before you get to that wallop scene. Suspense doesn't come out of whole cloth. You can't just open a movie with suspense and sustain it because the audience isn't invested yet. You have to get the audience invested in the characters and then get them into some kind of difficulty. And if the audience is invested, they will identify with the characters. And if it's suspense or humor or whatever, you, you need to make that, they need to be invested. And that's not easy to do. That's not an easy thing to do. And not many that I can name who have done it consistently. Uh, I mean, not that there aren't so many great films, but you're talking about suspense. And, you know, a film like Psycho, you got to go a long ways to uh, make a, a film as suspenseful as Psycho for me. Uh, what else? What else is suspenseful? Diabolique. Diabolique? Yeah. Diabolique certainly. Wages of Fear. That's H.G. Uh, Clouseau's other great film. The Wages of Fear. That's very suspenseful. It's great. Uh, what else? I don't know. Those are ours. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. <laughs> vertigo. Vertigo? I never got vertigo. I think it's okay. <laughs> Alien. Huh? Alien. Alien? Alien. Alien's great. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, I love Alien. That, that's a great suspense movie. I imagine that could still move me emotionally. Alien. And the first 40 minutes are all character. It's just a film about truckers. Alien is a great film. Uh, Halloween. It's coming up, isn't it? Oh. <laughs> we got a final question. Who has the best question of the night? Do you have the best question of the night? I think so. Okay. You said filmmaking was always sort of a job to you. What do you think would have happened to you? What do you think your career or life would have been had you not become filmmaker? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what if I had not been a filmmaker? Probably a thief. 